Station Sergeant John Hoytink of the Australian Federal Police has one big headache in his present job, hunters. They'll come over this way, they're looking for uh, just about any form of wildlife, including sparrows, and they uh, stand around blasting away at them with shotguns. And of course, as soon as they start shooting into the buffer zone, the Turks then think they're being shot at, which causes, a, causes us a huge problem, because we're the ones that are going, we've got to go and Australian policemen have been patrolling the barren hills of Cyprus ever since 1963, a contribution to the longest continuous peacekeeping operation in United Nations history. The war that destroyed these villages ended in a ceasefire 25 years ago. But to the north, an army of 40,000 Turkish troops is still on constant alert. To the south, 80,000 reservists of the Greek Cypriot National Guard can be in action within hours. Between them, running right across an island that's only one-sixth the size of Tasmania, runs a strip of no-man's land, sometimes kilometres, sometimes only metres wide. Officially, it's called the UN buffer zone. Unofficially, it's known as the dead zone. Sunday in Nicosia, one of the last divided cities in the world. In the southern half of the city and the southern two-thirds of the island, the faithful are gathered in the Greek Orthodox churches. But while some are praying, others are watching. Seven days a week, the soldiers of the Cypriot National Guard stare over their sandbags at what they call the Turkish occupied area, which starts just a few meters away. In between, through the heart of the city, runs the dead zone. 50 meters away on either side are cars and crowds and cafes. But here, you're in a time warp a quarter of a century old. As you can see, Now this area here is the narrowest in the whole buffer zone. At the end of the street, it's only 3.3 meters wide between the two ceasefire lines. Yeah. Now, Prior to 89 and the unmanning agreement, you had Turkish forces in this building, National Guard forces in that building, yeah. and there was a lot of problems with fighting back and forth across the building. Bayonets tied on long sticks, yeah. uh, so throwing were... stones and yeah. such. They were right on these balconies, were they? On these balconies, as you can see. Yeah. And uh, they used to tie the bayonets onto poles and try and stab each other across the balconies. And they used to also attach barbed wire to the end of the poles and try and drag each other into the buffer zone. Then they could lawfully shoot them. Here in the centre of Nicosia, things are a good deal less tense, since the two sides agreed to pull back a few metres nine years ago. But the buffer zone runs for 150 kilometres across the island. UN soldiers and police know all too well that trouble can flare any time, any place along its length. I'm not quite sure how much further we can go up here. They've got a lot of uh, blockades and uh, barriers up here, so I'm not quite sure how far we can go. So, Bruce, what's happening Like here? the time two years ago, when Sergeant Bruce Hayward was sent to the eastern end of the Green Line. And, uh, two years ago, this, uh, these, didn't, these large mounds didn't exist. They just had a, a free access road. You, right. could walk, you could walk straight through? Absolutely, yes. Right. Certainly can't do that now. No. In August 1996, Greek nationalist bikies invaded the buffer zone en masse to protest against the Turkish occupation. A few of them got through to the Turkish side, where one bikie, in full view of news cameras, was beaten to death by Turkish Cypriot civilians and police. Three days later, after his funeral, the furious bikies came back into the buffer zone determined to lay a wreath where their comrade had died. We um, came to assist the Irish police and uh, the crowd broke through the ranks. They got very emotional and uh, several thousand demonstrators came into the buffer zone. Uh, it was impossible to stop them all.
one Greek Cypriot man succeeded in getting as far as the Turkish side of the zone. He escaped his UN pursuers and tried to climb the flagpole to remove the Turkish flag. It was the last action of his life. I was probably about uh, 15 to 20 metres distance away and I could uh, so it was about to happen, but there was nothing I could do. When the firing started, there was mad panic by all the demonstrators. Could you hear the bullets going by? I could, I could hear them, and uh, they were actually landing in the ground in front of us. I really thought at that stage that uh, we'd be killed. Two British UN soldiers and 11 other demonstrators were wounded by Turkish gunfire. So what's the history that's led to this astonishing hatred and bitterness? Well, as you rapidly discover in Cyprus, that depends whose eyes you're looking through. Just as in Northern Ireland or Israel, there are two different accounts for almost everything that's happened here. The Greek Cypriots who stare north across the dead zone at the port city of Famagusta, where so many of them used to live, see only a brutal occupation by an alien army. The Turks had no right to come to Cyprus, they say, and even less to stay. Cyprus was a Greek island, and Cyprus is a Greek island, and Cyprus will stay a Greek island. The Museum of National Struggle in Nicosia is a shrine to the Greek Cypriot version of history. There have been Turks living here since 1570. Yes. Do they have any right to be on this island, do you think? Nobody is against them. The Greek side, we don't want to kill them. Uh, um, uh, but uh, they were 17%. 17% it's a minority. All over the world, in all countries, there are 17% minorities. The museum is dedicated to the martyrs of Aoka. The nationalists who fought the British through the 50s, not for independence, but for a gnosis, the union of Cyprus with Greece. The Greek Cypriots called them heroes. The British called them terrorists and hanged them when they could catch them. For the nationalists of Aoka, the independence granted Cyprus in 1959 was a bitter disappointment. The constitution forced the Greek Cypriot president, Archbishop Makarios, to share power with the Turkish minority. But the young republic was making the best of it, they argue, until Turkey invaded in 1974. Tens of thousands of Greek Cypriots were forced out of their homes in the north. They were replaced by settlers from mainland Turkey. Eleni Christoforou was one of those made homeless. And after 25 years, her bitterness is unabated. In the occupied area, you have 500 churches. The Turks changed to mosque, to, to museum, to stable, to coffee shop, uh, to showroom, to anything. Five churches changed to toilet. Uh, they say, let's have a negotiation. We have 120,000 Anatolians, barbarians, thieves, killers, gypsies, and uh, um, uh, uh, soldiers. They are sitting in our houses. They have uh, uh, all the guns. And they say, let's have a negotiation. What kind of negotiation can we have? What? On the Greek Cypriot side of the main crossing point in Nicosia, every weekend, mothers and sisters and wives display portraits of their loved ones arrested by the Turks in 1974. Most are no doubt long since dead, but these women insist that they're being held hostage somewhere. This is a society where no one from oldest to youngest is allowed to forget the past. Most Greek Cypriots will tell you that they no longer want union with Greece. They just want a united island. 
They'll tell you too that any strife between Turkish and Greek Cypriots was manufactured by outsiders. The solution will be in Cyprus. We shall be together as we lived centuries and centuries with the Turks together. Because I must tell you the truth, I love everybody, sir. The, our religion says love everybody, even the enemies of you. And Turks are not enemies of us. And yet everywhere in the supposedly independent Republic of Cyprus, the blue and white flag of Greece takes pride of place. If you're a foreigner, you can walk through the Greek checkpoint and past the old Ledra Palace Hotel, where the UN soldiers live. A hundred metres to the north, it's as though you've walked through the looking glass. Through another barbed wire barrier, and you're in another country with another motherland, another flag, another set of posters remembering other atrocities, a different history. The Turkish Republic of North Cyprus is recognized by no other country on earth except Turkey itself. But its leader justifies its existence by referring to his version of history. We were confined to 3% of the area and in, in, in little enclaves surrounded by Greek troops and Greek Cypriot troops for 11 years, denied all our rights. This was the policy for 11 years and no one cared. This uh, div dividing line, as everybody says, what a shame, uh, is it necessary, should it be, has an answer to it. The common graves, go and see it. Village after village was surrounded up and people were lined up irrespective of age, 16-day-old babies, one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, the whole population of an elementary school, and killed. Why? Because Makarios had made a statement in 1964, if Turkey comes to save Turkish Cypriots, and Turkey had the right to come and save us, Turkey will find no Turkish Cypriot to save. Elaborate memorials to obscene massacres dot the landscape of northern Cyprus. On their marble walls, the subliminal message is driven home. When Greeks and Turks shared the same territory, you were not safe, your families were not safe. The whole of this tiny island is crisscrossed with walls and fences and boundaries, some old, some new. These walls, in fact, were originally built by the Venetians to protect the city of Famagusta from the Ottoman Turks. But eventually the Turks won, and that beautiful church over there became a mosque. 400 years later, in an independent Cyprus of the 1960s, this old city here was in fact an enclave for Turkish Cypriots, who very seldom dared to venture outside its walls. The Greeks who were expelled from Famagusta in 1974 remember it as the wealthiest city in Cyprus. It's not so rich now. Many young men have no jobs. All trade must come through Turkey. So must the tourists, and few of them find their way to Zedgar Hoshkar's little antique shop. But at least now, unlike the 1960s, he says, he feels secure from Greek Cypriot oppression. They were blocking the roads. They were uh, arresting us. So I myself three times has been arrested for nothing. And I was very afraid that because they had many shotguns with them, many armed guns, you know, automatic guns. Uh, up to 1974, we are not safe. It is true, believe me. I'm not talking uh, with my military thing. Don't worry. How do you think Turkish Cypriots would feel if the Greek Cypriots could move back here? I don't trust them. Maybe uh, and still now I have many friends. We talk as friends, but I don't trust them. But some Cypriots on both sides of the buffer zone have been trying to build trust between the two communities. Kemal Nami is an Australian-born Turkish Cypriot who is a student in Famagusta. Several times last year, he attended meetings with Greek Cypriot students organized by the United Nations. So what did you expect before you met the Greek Cypriots? What did you think they were going to be like? Uh, everyone had this kind of vision that they were, they were going to meet with some creatures some monsters, 
So what did you actually discover? Well, everyone found out that it was quite different and uh, they were astonished. First of all, we realised that we were all human beings as a starter. And then we started to realise that we had a lot of common things. And you're all Cypriots, for example? Yep, yep. It was quite interesting and successful. Back on the Greek Cypriot side of Nicosia, I found another voice calling for reconciliation. Hello, everybody. Hello, Cyprus as a whole. Welcome to the Peace Garden, the first bicommunal programme of Cyprus. Trying to rebuild trust between the divided communities is almost a subversive activity in Cyprus. Mesha Yassin is an unusual woman, a Turkish Cypriot poet and peace activist who's decided to live in the Greek Cypriot south. You can dial 1010 and do not worry that your English is not good enough. Mesha's weekly radio show is in English because it's the only language Greek and Turk have in common. But there's a problem with the new direct dial telephone connection from the north, and only Greek Cypriot listeners get through. And my salutations to my Turkish Cypriot friends, Emre, Boran, Ali, Kamer, and Jem. And I Can I just ask you? I discovered that, like Kemal Nami in Famagusta, this Greek Cypriot caller had made friends across the buffer zone at UN organized bicommunal meetings. And her reactions were the same as Kemal's. Uh, the Turkish Cypriots are are just people like us, and they want peace too. I love them, I, I want to be friends with them. But the UN peacekeepers have had to stop trying to bring the two sides together. Instead, they're now training to keep them apart. The Greek Cypriot government's application to join the European Union without consulting the North has infuriated the Turkish Cypriot leader, Mr. Denktas. Earlier this year, he abruptly put a stop to the bicommunal meetings. Now, threats and accusations are being hurled by both sides. One of the few places that Turkish and Greek Cypriots can still meet is at Pillar, a village within the UN buffer zone where members of both communities have always lived peaceably together. Mind you, most of the time, they keep themselves to themselves. In the Turkish cafe, the old men play backgammon, as their forefathers have done in Cyprus for 400 years or so. And in the Greek cafe across the street, they discuss the state of the world, as Greeks have done since Socrates. People lived together so many years, 100, 200 years. But because the politics started the trouble. Politics, my friend. So do you go across and have coffee over that side sometimes? No problem. Listen, my friend, this is the true story. It's no problem. The problem is the big, big boss. The big fish eat the small fish. True? Of course. Due to the refusal of Mr. Rauf Dengtash to allow them to take part in rehearsals... The only bicommunal choir in Cyprus is putting on a concert, Turkish without its Turkish Cypriot together. members. The choir still insists in sending the message of friendship and peace. There have always been bigger fish than Mr. Dengtash, keeping the two communities in Cyprus apart. Greece and Turkey, Britain and America have all had their agendas here. But the island's own history and hatreds are still powerful ingredients of the brew. When the message of peace and friendship must be sung by half a choir to a stadium that's three quarters empty, the omens for would-be peacemakers aren't good.